Hello everyone and welcome back to my Realism Overhaul tutorials in Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1. In this video we're going to talk about bringing a space plane into orbit, at least one style of doing so, and that's the style where the space plane goes on top of a carrier plane. In previous videos we developed the space plane first, and then the carrier plane, and now we're putting them together. Uh, to see if the space plane can get to orbit in this sort of situation. Though I have to admit that the carrier plane is not exactly how I would have designed it. We have some constraints in terms of parts, and in later videos we'll add more and more parts, but I wanted to keep it simple because uh, otherwise we would get overloaded with choices. Even as it is, we've got quite a lot of choices. But in this case, we were sort of limited by the cockpit choice. And so we have the Mark III cockpit, it's nice and light, that's a good thing, but the shape of it sort of determined the shape of the rest of the carrier plane, which is what this is, and uh, the use of this adapter, and so not entirely thrilled with that. Another thing I'm not thrilled by is the dry mass of this uh, tank here, the shielded tank, which is the only tank that we have that seems to be able to deal with re-entry heat. And the problem is it's got a really high dry mass, and I think that's because it's assuming that the tiling is going all the way around, like the black tiles on the space shuttle are like all over it. So uh, that's just a guess. But if we could replace a section of this with a lighter tank, because after all, these tanks that we have here on these jet uh, packs, these are not the shielded tanks, and, but they still worked. They didn't get, get overheated. They're just uh, aluminum and lithium, which is the same as the space shuttle external tank. So, if we could put an aluminum lithium structure in the middle of this tank, that would lighten it up and help a lot. Otherwise, I've made a few changes. Um, we've reduced the amount of RCS fuel because while testing the carrier plane, we found out that we didn't need as much. And I've also reduced the amount of kerosene in these pods so that then we reduced the utilization, we just dumped that. So that because we found out that we didn't need as much of that, and then uh, I obviously took off the load, though uh, you don't have to do that. And I subassembled it uh, using this, so I just pulled the whole thing, I, uh, which got rerouted to a tank. So, I mean, you can just put whatever part you want on top of this, as long as it can actually surface attach to that. And then I reroute to that, and then pull the, the decoupler off, and I've already got the subassembly. So, anyway, uh, the overall put together sort of thing because that's a finicky thing trying to put the two together and I didn't want to record all my adjustments so I just did it so we take the bluer NJ which means no jet that's our little space plane and we put the carrier plane underneath it and the space plane is actually a little bit heavier than the 30 tons that we tested for. I didn't want to change the carrier plane too much from what we tested because it landed safely at Cape Canaveral and we really want to not change that a whole lot. But making it lighter overall isn't going to cause a huge problem. Uh, so we just took a little bit of fuel out of there and we're, we put more fuel in here at about the same mass as what we took out from the carrier plane. And uh, so this is now 33. Point uh, five six tons and that's mostly f extra utilization on this tank which feeds the rd58 engines so just a review these are the engines from the f15 they're the f100 engines these are the space shuttle main engines rs25s and uh, these are the rd58s which are configured as the oms engines of Buran. so that's our weird mix of engines but they are space plane engines if you'd like so space planes come in a few flavors. The first type, the first type that was conceived of was the little small space plane on top of a big expendable rocket and um, or uh, potentially a reusable rocket. But let's take expendable rocket first. So this is dinosaur on top of the Titan rocket or now Dream Chaser or an X-37 on top of a Atlas V or a Falcon 9. Uh, so that's type one. Uh, type 2 was this kind. This was the second type that was conceived of, and that was the space plane on top of another space plane, a carrier plane. And the carrier plane is considered a space plane because it would let go of the top space plane in space, usually. It gets it to high enough velocities that that would work, and that's because of optimal staging. Uh, basically, you can think of it as a two-stage rocket system with both stages recoverable, and we've already de demonstrated that it's possible to have 
this carrier plane recover itself by flying down to Cape Canaveral if we're taking off at Brownsville, which we will be. So, yeah, this is a Type 2 sort of deal. Um, though you could sort of expand it into something like Starship and Super Heavy, where uh, Starship is sort of a space plane and Super Heavy is a recoverable stage. Uh, you could sort of think of Super Heavy as sort of like a space plane all on its own in the recoverability factor. And so maybe it's a Type 2. Um, type 3 is, of course, a space shuttle. Uh, the space shuttle is the situation where the space plane is much larger. And the tank from the space plane, which we have a tank here, but instead of having the tank inside, we have the, a much larger tank outside. And then we put a larger engine on here instead of these two small ones. And that will be a space shuttle. And then usually you have to add boosters to that. Uh, so space shuttle, Buran, uh, that sort of deal. And uh, we will be turning this into a space shuttle too, and we'll be doing exactly what I just described. Uh, so that would be turning it into a space shuttle. And there are a few other uh, possibilities beyond those three, and we can talk about those. But those were basically the ones that were thought of uh, like uh, in the 60s, the 50s, 60s, that kind of thing. So anyway, um, I'm just trying to think if I've forgotten one that was thought of back then. Max, incidentally, the Max space plane is sort of weird in that it's a space shuttle. You know, it's got an external tank. It's not an internal tank. And, but instead of having SRBs to do the first stage, uh, to boost the first stage, uh, it's got an AN 225. So instead of having the solid rocket boosters, you have an AN 225, which doesn't help a whole lot, but I guess it helps. Uh, but there you are. So that's the Max space plane. It is sort of a space shuttle setup. All right, so let's test this out and see if it, uh, how close we get to orbit. But again, I have misgivings because the tank is a lot heavier than I would have liked it to be. If you, if this is the only shielded tank we've got, we really can't make an SSTO out of this. So we're going to have to do some configuring. When we get to SSTO stuff, we're going to have to come up with a configuration file adjustment or some, some sort of sneaky business. And I guess there ought to be a tutorial about that too. How to do sneaky business in Kerbal Space Program. Um, so we'll have to mess with that a little bit in order to get the space plane, the SSTO space plane to work when we get to that. All right, so let's go with this and see how close we get to orbit. Okay, well, obviously the first, this is actually a good sign that it's uh, flopping on its tail. That's close to the center mass. As long as we can get to get back onto its uh, nose, there we go. We know that it's good for rotation and everything. All right, so our pilot, uh, sorry, atmospheric autopilot on, and uh, seven for a little bit of flaps. Okay, and we might as well do the brake thing. All right, throttle up and ignition. Now we actually should get a little bit more lift because our test payload did not have wings, right? So we might be in a better aerodynamic situation than we were during the tests, but still we're probably going to end up using the lip at the end of the runway or something. And we are not going to follow the carrier plane down. Part of the point of doing that test and showing you that was to demonstrate that it'll work. We've only lightened it up since then, uh, so I expect it'll work again. And we're not going to redo that part. We're going to follow the space plane this time. We can't do both at the same time. Uh, which reminds me, we're going to have to transfer Jeb and Bill up to the space plane. Uh, well, actually they should already be in the space plane, I think. So we can rotate, but I don't want... Oh, we skipped the tail. Oh, that's not going to work very well. Well, yeah. Believe it or not, that body flap makes a huge difference in terms of the lift, too. I think, um... Well, it's part of the carrier plane, though, so we're not following that, but then it's a little bit of mass that we just lost that might change things. Alright, we'll, we'll do it again. Off we go again!
Interesting, we've got liquid oxygen boil off, but not the liquid hydrogen. Hmm. Well, a little bit of rotation and then much more rotation. We need 15 degrees here, basically. Okay, gear up. And flaps up. Alright, we are on our way. We need to turn to the heading that would get us to Cape Canaveral because the carrier plane still needs to land there, of course. In theory, we're not going to follow it down, but consistency. I do plan to improve the Dulcinea so that I can do other payloads. I mean, after all, you can strap anything that's 30 tons to the top of it, as long as it's not too bulky, of course and it would still be able to do its job so yeah exploring that possibility is something that I look forward to I don't think we need to reserve more than 5,000 units of kerosene in fact we didn't even use the jets on the sense last time but you know just in case we'll reserve some of course, on the jets, we hardly get anywhere. It's all the RS-25, but directional, directionally, we are pointed at Cape Canaveral, so that's nominal. Oh, we're slowing down here. Let's not go too high. Unfortunately, we don't have a remote controller on the Mark III cockpit, so it's got not enough crew here. We should at least put one of those controllers like in the nose or or something. Well, maybe on the tail would be best actually, most protected. Mm -hmm. We're gonna go as high as we can. Um, again, reserving 5,000 kerosene. So again, if you didn't watch the previous videos on the space planes, you might want to do that if you don't understand what's going on here. As far as the how-to, I realize this isn't a whole lot of tutorial. I'm just demonstrating the product of the previous tutorials. Okay, we're having trouble getting a whole lot of lift here. We'll, we'll try and push the jet engines a little bit longer just so that we can burn off the kerosene. Okay, I think that's good enough. Alright, ignition. And tilt up. Again to 45 degrees. Okay, switching off the jets. Reserving 5,200 kerosene there, it looks like. Again, we do want to get a whole lot of surface velocity, horizontal velocity. In addition to making sure we get to space, so it's a sort of balance here. We're going to end up going less fast with uh, the carrier plane than we did during the test because we've put more fuel in the space plane and so it's carrying a heavier load in this case. Which will be fine for its own recovery and we certainly had enough glide range to compensate for falling a little bit shorter. Keep a pitch that maintains the time to apoapsis. And then this thing has a really long burn time, so that's not good, necessarily. Okay, and separation, and RCS on, and... Ignition. Uh, ignition. Okay, again, we don't have a whole lot of thrust weight ratio here. This might be in need of some changing. I'll, I'll stick to SAS for now. We've got to turn off the RCS. We should be controllable with just the rocket engines. This is very inefficient. 
We might need the carrier plane to toss us up a little bit higher than this. But that'll cause problems for the carrier plane too. Now if we could change this shielded tank into a partial non-shielded tank, because you know these are still the non-shielded tanks after all, maybe that'll help out. We could also put a little bit of fuel in there, but it's not a matter of putting more fuel though. Thrust weight ratio. Maybe we should replace these engines with the engine that we'll eventually use for the rocket. Uh, for the, sorry, um, the um, shuttle, shuttle version. Which will be more powerful. Well, we will get to test re entry somehow. Since this is supposed to be a tutorial series, I think maybe I'll save refinements on this system for non-tutorial episodes. You get the picture. It's just now that we have to figure out how to lighten things up and optimize things. It comes down to choice of engines and such. And tanks. We got two RCS ports on the tail. The, the Basically the deorbit system. having them expend some of theirs right now. Problem is, there really aren't any more efficient Sintin... I mean, more efficient kerosene oxygen engines or anything in this class. So instead of using them to deorbit, we are actually using them to boost our orbit a little bit here. Anything to mitigate the severity of re-entry. Okay, well, we better get into a re-entry attitude. So, typical shuttle re-entry attitude. And we'll see whether it works or not. I haven't tried bringing it back down like this, so... It'd be nice if we could skip glide a bit. Note that even though we got to 7,100 meters per second, which is, you know, 700 shy of orbit we can't even get across the Atlantic like that you basically have to get to orbit in order to have a suborbital transport system anyway one downside to space planes is of course how long re-entry takes and you don't necessarily want to physical time warp through it because the, the math doesn't always work great then it does change, by the way. I've tried uh, with KOS controlling the shuttle, uh, doing it without time warp, and then doing with time warp, and, well, doing it with the physical time warp does change things quite a lot. It always ends up short, somehow. We're using a bit of our pitch authority, but not a lot yet, but that's going to increase dramatically soon and will be of concern. The RCS thrusters are not very powerful. But you can already see the ones on the nose puffing. Oh boy. I'm gonna try and move fuel from the forward tank into the tail tank. Let's try and help the balance a bit. Uh, it's looking like it's pretty maxed out there. So it's a bit nose heavy. And the engines are overheating? I don't understand why, really. That's confusing. Um, well, maybe they're not properly shielded by these down here. We need to tuck them in a little bit more, maybe. Oh boy. It's gonna get really nose-heavy if the engines go. Yep. And... No, it's really nose-heavy. Uh, let me reduce the expected pitch, because it's not gonna be able to hold that anyway. Still got the decoupler debris here, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, uh, that's aesthetic. Oh, we're going up though. 
the 40 degree pitch would probably prevent us from going up quite as much. But then again, we sort of want to try and hit land, so maybe it's okay. We seem to have passed through the worst of the heating, so maybe if we pitch down, we can glide a bit. We're doing a skip gliding thing. Well, the G-Force is 3.5 Gs so far, so not bad. It looks like the heat tolerance on the RD58s is only 673 Kelvin. It's a wonder they operate as engines at all. So, okay, I think I'm going to have to look into that. <laughs> I mean, I that seems rather suspicious, but uh, okay. But I mean, of course they they cool themselves by running, you know, propellant through and but what what are the nozzles made out of, or what is the chamber made out of that only has 673 Kelvin worth of heat tolerance? They're not made out of aluminum here. That's not far off from being able to control itself. I mean, yeah, just a little bit of a shifting of the center of mass backwards would probably help. Still a long ways from Africa, though. Will we get there? I don't know. Will we reach our abort site in Dakar? I don't know where exactly it is actually, <laughs> but um, somewhere around there. I mean, we don't actually have a runway there right now, of course, but so it's academic. But in principle, Okay, so here we go again. We're encountering some heat as we're going down, but the vertical speed is picking up, so we're skip gliding again. So that, that was an idea for space planes early on, this skip gliding technique. Hit the atmosphere, bounce off a little bit, hit the atmosphere, bounce off. But it doesn't really get you that far unless you're already going very, very fast. Right, we were 90% of the speed to orbit already. So it's not that big a deal. It's not a particularly good way to get around the world. We are running out of the RCS fuel. Then again, we're also getting slower. So that's good. We are currently here. So we're not that far from the Africa coast. So there's a chance we could land this. A chance. <laughs> There was some liquid oxygen boil off, uh, so we have a little bit of spare sentin in there. That's not going to help us get to orbit though. I don't have tack life support installed yet. We didn't do that, so we've got the food bar and oxygen, but they're not being consumed yet. We should probably change that. We should probably add that in too. But I'm, I still have to pick between tack life support or Kerbalism for this realism overall install, because both would work. You only need one. And maybe I'll get your thoughts on that. Which should we install into this tutorial install? Should we go Tag Life Sport or should we go Kerbalism? I think Kerbalism might be, might give me more to talk about, but yeah, there's a lot of stuff going on there. And if you have any other topics that you want me to cover for the tutorials for Realism Overhaul, please feel free to say so. This is not an RP1 tutorial, obviously. Um, that's a whole other business. We are running out of RCS fuel. I'm gonna sort of reduce how much pitch I'm expecting out of this. Um, I'm gonna risk taking off the RCS and seeing how much the control surfaces do. Okay, the control surfaces are handling it okay. I mean, it's still really close to maxing out the pitch and everything. I think we can do 20 degrees of pitch with just the control surfaces right now. There's a roll and yaw wiggle. I might switch back to atmospheric autopilot soon, since we're getting pretty atmospheric. But best to be at slower speeds so that the transition doesn't throw us off. Okay, I uh, yeah, I think we can land this. 
or at least try to. Okay, I'm gonna switch to atmospheric autopilot now. That was sort of what I was expecting it would do. We'll give it a little bit of pitch, not a whole lot. We don't want to go down too fast. But we also don't want to stall or anything, so... Remember, any angle that you have to the prograde vector will create drag and slow us down, and if we slow down too dramatically, that will stall us. You can always have FAR to keep an eye on things. You can see the coast now. Normally, um, I would pitch down the shuttle that around here to its negative 20 degree pitch, which it approaches at. We'll just go to zero here. This sort of region of heating is mainly due to the size of Kerbin. It's not really reflective of a whole lot. You can see we're at Kerbin orbital velocities. Well, you know, we made it to Africa in 43 minutes. That's something, I suppose. Even with atmosphere autopilot, it's wiggling quite a lot. Interesting. Oh, it fell down just as I talked about it. It's like it heard me. Now, well, since I don't have a runway prepared, I can land pretty much anywhere, I figure. Okay, let's go to that negative 20 pitch. We've got a lot of heat effects and g-forces. The shell mitigates the g-forces by having an air break at this point. Well, that wouldn't mitigate it. Whatever. It's it's mild still, anyway. Ooh, if we try try a turn during this, though, it's severe. Okay, we are now subsonic. Well, we crossed the Atlantic in record time. We lost two engines. Though, I maintain that that was dubious. And let's see if we can land here. Just trying to kill some velocity here. Wiggling away from prograde. Okay. I mean, we're very light now. Let's take a look at our mass. Got this huge wing and we're only 8 tons. Okay, we got it going pretty slow. The big wing does help with creating drag and slowing down if you deviate from prograde. Very mysterious sort of landscape we've got here. Low-level clouds, mist. Seems like very flat ground. It is sort of sunset right now. Okay, well, we're pretty close to the ground, and I want to find out what kind of speed we ought to land at. Um, Alright, this seems about right here. And there we go. All right, very nice touchdown speed, slowing down on the brakes. So yeah, I mean, for our first try for orbit, this is pretty good. You're gonna have to go through a whole iterative process and cut down masses here, try and find better engines there. One thing we could do is, uh, if we could get better jet engines on the carrier plane, maybe boost it past Mach 1, initially on the kerosene, that would help. And um, we could reconsider the wing on this. Maybe we don't need that much wing, right? I mean, if we could lighten this up, uh, that would help a lot. And maybe we have too much wing here and cut down the mass on the wing in order to give it more delta V and help it make orbit. There are all sorts of these little things. With space planes, there's 
a whole lot more options in terms of optimizing and uh, customizing it for the mission in mind. But I'm not going to go through all that. I've already discussed quite a lot of the things that I would intend to do and I probably will do. Uh, next time we're going to convert it to a space shuttle. And so that's going to be a whole other topic, obviously. And we'll see how that works out for us on that first try. But, you know, NASA managed it on its first try, so, you know, maybe we'll have some hope. Alright, so with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.